as Dr. Dixon said and Google, I am from New Zealand. Um, so I moved up uh, four years ago. Some of you may not be familiar with my accent and I do tend to speak quite fast. So if you need me to speak slower or louder or clearer, please um, type in the chat box to tell me that. Or if you don't want to tell me directly, you can tell Dr. Dixon and he will let me know. Um, I also want to say that I'm not really an, I guess, an expert or a specialist or an academic um, in any field. All I can really offer is about 10 years worth of general practice and some tips and tricks um, that I have learned from um, lecturers and my seniors and uh, my mistakes, I guess, along the way. So I'm hoping that um, I'll be able to share some of these with you. Um, today. Uh, like you said, I've got two parts to the lecture. Uh, the first will be on oral hematomas and their management, and the second is um, on managing fearful cats and dogs. The two sections are not really connected, but I thought they would just be quite interesting um, and make a good combination for today. So I also will be asking you some questions just to get a bit of interaction going on. So um, when I ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself and answer, or also um, type in the chat box the answer if you would like to, to get a bit of audience participation um, as well. Cool. All right. So let's start off. Um, oral hematomas. Okay. My computer is just thinking about things. Ooh, okay. Right, oral hematomas. I'm sure many of you have seen oral hematomas before. It's a collection of fluids in between the skin and the cartilage of the pinna of the ear. Um, it often looks like this. Or on the side, it will look a little bit like a swelling or a bubble like this. Um, I'd be interested to know, maybe you can just type in the chat box, um, how many, how often would you see or treat an oral hematoma? Are you able to, um, to share that with me? That one, can you remember to say, how often do you see an oral hematoma? Is that once a year or once a month? or once every few months, if you're able to just write in there. What question? Maybe, I mean, I've seen only in the winter months. The winter months, okay. Once every few months, yeah. Okay. Well, twice a week, all right. So twice a week, we've got a few months. They're relatively common. Um, but it's, yeah, it may depend on the season and the management and how quickly they get to you. Okay, so they're quite free from you want. You can continue your answers um, to know if that was a relevant topic. Now, let's see if I can move on. Okay, all right, so the signs of an oral hematoma. Um, you can get head shaking, you can get scratching, you may get a red ear. Often clients won't know how to describe it. They don't really know what it is. So they might say there's a lump in the ear, they might say there's some fluid, they might say there's a bubble or a swelling. So uh, when you hear this being described on the phone, it is always good to just think in the back of your mind, it's probably a hematoma. A little bit of anatomy and physiology. I'm not academic, but just a little bit. Okay, so the uh, blood supply to the ear is provided by the carotid artery. Uh, use the caudal auricular artery that comes up the back or the caudal aspect of the pinna and it has these branches like this. Um, branches of this artery go through the, the cartilage um, of the pinna and onto the concave side uh, and then it's arranged down this way. Uh, so usually the skin on the concave side of the pinna is firmly attached to the underlying cartilage. But when there is some trauma, 
that creates that attachment, that allows the attachment to come loose and creates dead space. And in addition to that, there's bleeding, and the bleeding will fill up the dead space uh, and form what we know as a hematoma, is this uh, fluid filled cavity. If we don't treat it, then the body will try and fix itself. It will resorb away the blood, um, will put down scar tissue and a lot of fibrosis. Um, and then uh, you might be left with a deformation of the ear uh, of the pinna um, or, and also obstruction to the vertical ear canal. Um, so you need to be careful about this and this is why we want to be treating them and not leaving them alone. So what, you can get yourself to answer this question or type in the chat box. What underlying or concurrent related disease do we always need to check for when we're dealing with an oral hematoma? What other disease process do we always need to be uh, aware of and check for? Can anybody tell me? You can unmute yourselves and say, or you can type in the chat box. Um, an otitis externa. Otitis externa, very good, thank you. So otitis externa is definitely what we need to check for, okay? So we always want to check for an ear infection. Often this is the underlying cause. The animal's got an ear infection and they're scratching and they're shaking their head so much that it's caused the blood vessels to burst and cause the hematoma. You need to look down both ears, um, not just the side of the hematoma because sometimes they'll, often they'll have it on both sides. Um, if you weren't here for my last webinar a, a few weeks ago, um, I did one on otitis externa. So there is a webinar recording of that. If you'd like that, please ask Dr. Dixon. And I've also got a handout with some uh, drug dose rates um, in the notes, which that can be sent out to you as well. So just ask Dr. Dixon for that. All right. So management. We've either got the choice of surgery, which in most cases is the preferred option, or conservative management, which involves draining and steroids. Uh, and which one you choose, um, or end up doing depends on the size of the hematoma. It depends on the position of the hematoma on the ear, um, the risk that anesthetic poses to the patient, and of course, client finances, um, which restrict a lot of what we do. Um, so, if we say we've got this oral, uh, this ear pinna here like this, um, and say we've got a hematoma that looks like this, covering this large part of the ear. Um, can you please tell me, would you much rather prefer to do surgery on this one or can you get away with just draining, conservative draining? Do you want to type surgery. surgery? Any other yeah. ideas? Does anybody else want to confirm that or object to that? Anybody else want to do surgery on that one or? And we look at the chat, agree, yep, surgery, cool. And why do we want to do surgery on this one here? Why is it so important? The cavity is too large. That's right, it's a very large one. And as you can see, it extends down to the entrance of the ear canal. So if we get fibrosis and thickening of the ear canal, oh, sorry, of the, the ear cartilage, then it may cause obstruction to the vertical ear canal. Yeah, so we definitely want to do surgery. Very good, thank you. All right, what if we have one that looks... Sorry, guys. I don't know why my slide is a bit stuck. Okay, so what if we've got one little one just like this at the tip of the, of the pinna? Would we like to do surgery on this one, or do you think we can get away with conservative management? Yeah, we've got some answers coming in. Anybody else want to take a vote? Surgery or conservative? Anybody? Don't think we necessary. Yep, conservative. So we've got a few votes for conservative. Very good. So, yeah, I think if it's a small one like this, um, we could probably get away with conservative management. Um, it is small, um, so the chances of it being able to be drained uh, sufficiently are okay. Um, it is on the tip of the pinna, though, so depending on what sort of dog you've got, you may get flopping of the ear, 
um, when it heals. So the owner has to be aware of that. But that's, that's not a bad option to do. Um, yeah. Now look at this one. So this is about the same size, but it's sort of down a little bit um, to the bottom. It's probably not as easy to be seen, to be honest. The client may not notice this one. Would you do surgery on this one, or should we try conservative as well? What would people like to do? Can you vote? Surgery or conservative, we've got both. We've got conservative, we've got almost equal, I think. Yeah, so this one, even though it's small, I would rather push for surgery. Um, yeah, I would, try, I would try and push for conservative only because of its position. So it's down by the bottom um, of the tuna and more towards the uh, entrance of the vertical ear canal. So if we get a lot of scarring and fibrosis here, this could narrow the ear canal and this can predispose to ear infection. So because of the position, I would probably uh, push more for um, surgery. So, so that's good. This is sort of how we want to make our um, our recommendation and our, um, decision. So, what is conservative training? It's um, not a complicated process in theory, um, but the animal is often conscious, which doesn't make it very easy. So, usually, I will clean the uh, portion of the skin with a bit of antiseptic. Uh, then, I will uh, spray some local anaesthetic onto there. We can um, um, talk about that in a second. And then I'll use either 22 or 20 gauge catheter, insert that in, take the stilet out, and either it will drain out passively, or if the animal lets me, I will put the syringe onto the end of that catheter and actually suck out the fluid. Um, there's another technique described by using a butterfly catheter. Um, so this one you can see in the photo here, there's a butterfly catheter being placed into the hematoma. And then if you want, you could attach that to a closed suction system. Um, here they're using a vacuum chainer, so just inserting a needle into the vacuum chainer and using that, um, is that, that negative pressure to drain out the fluid. You may need a couple of those, or you can use a syringe. Um, so that's also possible as well. Then you want to try and inject um, dexamethasone into the lesion. So about 0.2 to 0.4 mg um, saline, with maybe half a mil of saline, depending on the size. I often find this quite tricky because often the animal has got a sensitive ear anyway and they don't like the fact that you're injecting, you're, you're stabbing it to start off with. Once it's drained, often they'll be shaking um, and sometimes maybe a catheter will fall out um, before you've injected the dexamethasone. So that can be, it's often harder than we think. Um, I'll then send them home on oral semethasone half to one meg per peg per day. And then you need to emphasize to the owner that they need to come back for a revisit. Um, because often, in my experience, um, and I'm interested to hear the experience of others, um, conservative draining isn't very successful um, a lot of the time. So you have to warn the owner that it may come back, it may need repeated draining. Um, so they will need to revisit. And they also need to come back for the ear infection follow up treatment anyway. Um, and sometimes after they come back in three or four days, it needs to be drained again, and then again and again. After that another time and money, you might as well have done the surgery. So they just need to be aware um, of that. Okay. Surgery is relatively straightforward. It's not a difficult surgery. If you're able to place sutures, if you're able to do a spay or castrate, you're more than qualified to do the surgery. So it's something that you can definitely be attentive in this minute. Um, so what you'd be wanting to do is, is shave the area, um, give it a clean. You want to make a large incision over the uh, whole hematoma. It can be a little curved S shape like this, or it can be straight. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then you want to flush out the blood clots and all the fluid. You can use some saline to do that with a bit of pressure. Use a gauze swab um, to do that. And then you want to leave the primary incision open so that the fluid can drain out of that. But you want to oppose the cartilage and the skin using mattress stitches like this, about one centimeter in length. 
Uh, and in this diagram, they haven't gone full thickness to the other side. Most of the time, I will go full thickness all the way to the end um, and back through again. I just think it's a lot easier. Um, but you don't, think um, you don't want the sutures to be too tight. They need to obviously hold the skin to the cartilage, um, but you don't want them to be too tight because if they are, they can be very um, irritating, but also they can pull through if there's enough tension on them. In this diagram, they have put the knot. Uh, on the concave side of the ear, so on the side that we can see. Um, but over the years, I've actually learned to tie the knot on the other side of the ear, so on the convex side, um, on the side here. And the reason being that um, there's a lot of discharge and fluid that comes out of here. So the knots are on the side, they just seem to get really wet and have a lot of discharge and quite icky. Um, and it's much easier to keep clean and a lot tidier if the knots are on the other side. Um, so that's just what I've learned um, over the years. Okay. So I find using a straight cutting needle is easier because you do have to get through quite a lot of um, tissue. You need to get through the skin and then the cartilage and then the skin on the other side. So using a straight, sharp cutting needle is often easier than a curved, uh, round body one. And then you um, will use nylon, so a non-absorbable um, suture, or monofilament absorbable suture would be all right to use as well. Now, you now you lose a lot of cat gut um, in India. I probably wouldn't be recommending cat gut uh, for the surgery. Does anybody want to um, suggest why um, cat gut may not be a good option in the surgery? Anybody want to unmute themselves and? And say or um, just type in the text box. Why wouldn't we want to use text up uh, in this in this option? Do you oppose? Do you oppose the two cut in together? Do you switch them into the cartilage? Definitely. Um, not sure I, Dr. Rocco, I might answer that question at the end. Can you ask that one at the end for me? Okay. Anybody want to say why don't we use cat gut for this surgery? Anybody want to unmute themselves and and yes? No? You have to unmute cat yourself. Cat may get swell up. Cat gut may swell? Um, swell up because when it comes into contact with the fluid or whatever yes. it is, it may get spoiled. It can swell absorb, absolutely. that's right, it can absorb the water, yes. Yeah. And then, uh, and what else? What, what will cat gut do? What about the absorption or the resorption of cat gut or the shrink? Oh, Resorb, so yeah, Debbie said it will absorb too quickly. That's right. So cat gut um, is a natural, uh, is a natural fiber. Um, it is good and it's strong, I guess, to a certain extent. But the strength quickly, um, I guess, decreases around about 10 to 14 days. And these sutures, you want to hold them in for 14 to 21 days. Um, so cat gut won't, will probably um, resolve in that time. Um, so it won't last long enough. So um, that's one reason that we don't want to use cat gut. The other reason, I guess, is that because cat gut um, is a braided suture, so it's got lots of filaments um, all twisted together. Um, braided sutures aren't recommended for anywhere that's non-sterile or that has a high chance of there being bacteria, because the bacteria like to um, live in those little um, um, nooks and crannies of the of the braided material. Um, so it's more likely to serve as a nidus for infection. Um, and cat gut, because of, again it's a natural uh, fibre in um, infected or inflamed areas, it actually resorbs even quicker 
than in a sterile area. So um, here's obviously non-sterile. You've got uh, neutrophils and bacteria and dirt and everything around there. So um, cacti would, would absorb even faster than you expected. So um, I'll avoid that if at all possible. Um, but your monofilament ones like the CDS um, will last a much longer time. Um, so they could be used instead of the nylon. Uh, so the next one should just say that sometimes we can use stents to place on the uh, sutures material here to minimise the tension and stop them from pulling through. Another option is to use a plastic, a sheet of plastic that could just be even just a cut up plastic bottle um, that we can suture on there as a kind of a, a big stent. Uh, and lastly, we can place a penrose vein into the ear as well and treat it a bit like an open wound. Um, and that would be um, possible as well. Okay, just before we move on, can anybody unmute themselves and tell me why we would like to place these sutures this way, in this orientation, apart from this orientation? Looking at sort of the shape of the ear and the anatomy that we talked about before. Can anyone like to unmute themselves or, or place uh, something in the chat box to suggest why we want to orientate the natural sutures that way? Is it because the sutures run with the shape of the ear? Um, Yes, yes, the shape of the ear, but in particular, what part of the ear? Um, a clue is the sort of part of the ear that we can see here, they talked about originally. That's right, so very good to so avoid blocking the arteries. Yes, the blood vessels, very good. So uh, you don't want to inadvertently ligate all of these blood vessels off with your sutures. Um, you don't want them there to be necrosis on the back or the front of the ear and placing your mattress sutures this way it has a higher risk of doing that so you want to do them parallel to the ear margin um, or the blood vessels so uh, that's the reason why we do that very good okay so we've got a few pictures here um, these are plastic uh, stents I this is a um, technique that I was taught and that I always do um, I use IV tubing so cut up ivy tubing here. Um, I just chop it up into about half to one centimetre length and then place them in alcohol to sterilise them so the whole thing doesn't need to be sterile. Uh, and then they can be placed either on the inside here, so just thread the suture through and then tie the knot. Um, you can see this is the primary incision here. Um, or more recently, I've learned to put them on the back of the ear instead of on the concave side. Um, just like this. And the reason I do that is because, um, the, like I said, the discharge, there's a lot of it coming from around here, um, and there's all the blood and fluid that kind of gets collected up and it just looks very yucky and, and harder to clean. But on the outside, it just keeps uh, everything a little bit tidier. And also, they can be a little bit easier to remove um, when they're on the outside. But either or should be fine, or both, I guess, if you want it. Um, this is a plastic bottle that's been cut up and then placed with a stent like this. Uh, I haven't used this technique before, but I think it would be a good one. They've placed their mattress sutures again similar like this, and they've cut a hole here where the primary incision is to let that drain out. Um, I think probably this could be done on the back of the ear as well for similar reasons. This technique is meant to be good in ears that stand up straight, um, erect ears. So I guess ones like, say, your German Shepherds that have very long, tall ears that stand up. Um, with placing um, stents with the other techniques, I guess sometimes it's a bit heavy and they can kind of droop. Um, and again, with the fibrosis and scarring, sometimes the ear can just fall over and not be standing upright. Um, yeah, so uh, this plastic bottle or plastic, whatever you want to use, um, starts to stand it up. Oh, cool. Debbie has said that they use x ray film as well. That's right. Uh, when I, at uni, I was taught about the x ray film, but I didn't know. We don't have film anymore, actually, so I um, don't know if we've got any old archives of film to use. But anything plastic and light, 
um, and relatively clean will be fine to use for that. And then um, the other option, um, slightly different, is to treat it a bit like a wound and make an incision at the top uh, of the hematoma, then at the bottom, and place the ten rows drainage to aid with drainage. This one doesn't have the natural sutures um, along it, so it doesn't uh, attach the cartilage to the skin. So, um, yeah, I haven't done it before, so I can't comment on if this is good or not. Um, but that is also a prescribed technique. Okay, so anything, um, client communication is really important. So we want to make sure the owner knows that recurrence is possible, even with surgery. Uh, more so with uh, conservative management, but even with surgery, it is possible for it to come back again. Um, surgery is still the best option, however. Um, you need to prepare them that there can be some scarring uh, that occurs even with the surgery. Um, we need to eliminate the underlying infection. So if the owner isn't able to medicate the ear or doesn't want to medicate the ear for some reason, there's going to be problems and the um, hematoma may come back. Um, they do need to wear an e collar for the whole time that the stitches are in. So this cone of shame. Um, I think they will be available in India. If not, you might be able to, if you're rural or somewhere, you might be able to make, do a makeshift um, makeshift ear collar. We just don't want them scratching at their ears and then scratching out your nice um, stents and stitches um, because they can be quite irritated. Um, and then you need to have the stitches out in 14 to 21 days. Usually I'll get them back for a post-op check at three days and then see how they're going and then I'll get them back at 14 days and have a look. If I think all the stitches can come out, if it's all healed well, I'll take them out. Sometimes I will take some of them out and leave other stitches in just to hold for a bit longer and then I'll take the rest out a week later. So you can just stagger these suture removal as well. While we're waiting, is there any comments uh, maybe from the other um, doctors who have treated this before about the other techniques, using humor refrain or using um, suture um, material? Okay, Debbie said that you can make an e collar out of a bucket with a bottom cut out, depending on the size of the dog. Um, yes, that's right, actually. In, in rural practice in New Zealand, we used to suggest that too. So you can make your own bucket collar with. Uh, literally with a bucket. All right. Okay. Um, bandaging. I put this one in here. I've never bandaged before. I've never taught to, and I haven't actually ever seen it. Um, but it is a described technique, and I just wanted to know, Debbie, do you have you ever bandaged something before, or do you think it necessary or, or helpful? Um, usually not. Okay. Yeah. So it, you can look them up in textbooks. We'll just have a look at this. Um, but usually I haven't needed to. So that's the end of the first section of hematomas. Um, I'll just put this in here as a bit of a interlude. This is my cat, um, fluffy cat. His name is Kirchik. Um, and the title of this photo is Meditating on the Word of God. So I was just thinking of preparing, I guess, as veterinarians, um, as students, we want to do our best um, reading our textbooks and reading our articles and papers to upskill ourselves and serve our patients and our, our clients well. Um, and be the best professional that we can be. I guess as Christians, those of us with a faith, we also want to be um, reading our Bibles um, and just feeding our souls and our spirits with the Word of God and other positive things so that it can help us to serve um, our brothers and sisters um, and others um, in our lives as well. So my cat is a prime example of that, sitting here on my couch reading the Bible. Okay, so we're going to go to the next section uh, when my computer wakes up. It is behaviour tips and it is dealing with aggressive or fearful animals in the clinic. And I'm sure we've all come across these um, in our due time. Um, I've got a photo up there in the scene that you'll see. Um, two months ago, I was bitten quite badly by an aggressive cat when I was trying to vaccinate it. I was sitting on my hands. 
um, and they were a bit worried about a joint infection because it went quite deep. Um, and so eventually I had to end up going to the emergency department uh, at the local hospital. Uh, I had to have IV fluids and have minor surgery to flush out all the um, the infection and everything in my in my hand. So um, it's, I guess it is one of the hazards of the job, but we need to care, take care of ourselves. And hopefully some of the tips I'm going to um, share with you today are going to help keep us um, safe and also make it uh, make our life a bit easier and also uh, make our patients' lives a bit more calmer and um, uh, and enjoyable as well. So this is me at the emergency department with uh, my hand being fixed up. All right, so starting off with cats. Um, towel wrapping is a really great technique. Some of you may be familiar with it um, and some of you not. The idea is to wrap up the cat, and some of you can do it for small dogs as well, in a towel, wrap them up quite closely and tight. So one is that they can't move, uh, and the other is that they will actually be able to, um, they feel very safe. I think it's a little bit like a herd, I don't know children, but wrapping up a baby quite tightly in, in blankets when they sleep because they feel um, secure in that and they're a bit more relaxed. So I'm going to show you a couple of videos about towel wrapping. So let's take a look at this one. Can you guys see? Can you guys see this one? Can you guys tell me if you can see this? We are able to see the screen, but uh, video. You can see the video? Not it. We are able to see the screen. You your screen. your laptop screen. Not have all these technical difficulties last time. Can you see it now? No. You can see the video? No. No? Yeah, no, no, now we can yeah. see. You can see yeah. it, yes? Yeah, yeah we can see, ma'am. Okay, good. We can see, ma'am. All right. Okay, so you can see me wrapping up the cat. It has to be quite tight on both sides. Okay, and then don't forget the back because you don't want them sliding out backwards. Okay, and this is to prepare them for a jugular puncture, for taking your blood sample from the jugular. So you want to wrap up both feet and then gently lift up the head and then you can take a sample safely without them scratching. Okay. Now I'm going to show you one where we're towel wrapping a kitten. Can you tell me if you can see this one? In a second. Can you see this one? Yeah, 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 we yeah. see it, yeah. Okay. yeah. All right, so this one is wrapping up the kitten to to um, place the cephalic uh, catheter. Okay, so it's the same kind of technique, but you want to leave one arm out. And also, because you're not needing the head, you can actually uh, wrap up the head in the towel so it can't bite you while you're trying to place the catheter. Okay, so it's like this. Okay. Cool. All right, let's go back to 
to my actually i'm going to show you another video straight while we're doing this so the next technique i don't know what it's called i've thought it's called three pink pigs because that's what we used to call it when i was a new graduate um, i've seen since weaned myself onto two pigs um, and they don't have to be pink now but basically you want to put um, two or three pigs on the back of the trough of cats and it can also um, almost make them very very sedate can you see this for me yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. alright so just putting and uh, we're just putting two pigs here on the back of the scruff and he's gone very sedate and often you can take your temperature you can check in their mouth you can do their nails so a lot of things by just um, putting the pigs onto the back of their scruff um, it works better in younger cats or kittens rather than older ones um, so I would probably try doing it in something that's less than one year old after one year old you can try them uh, but sometimes they don't work um, as well. This is another video of a kitten that I did. Um, it was quite a calm kitten to start off with. Um, and I'm not sure the exact mechanism, but uh, I think it has something to do with the mother when they used to pick them up by the scruff with their mouth. They tend to go quite flaccid and relaxed. So I think we're just mimicking that. And then when you take it off, they just suddenly become quite alert again. So that's a really nice trick that I use for yeah a lot of a lot of kittens. I used to do it a lot of, uh, in New Zealand, um, and when I got to Australia, I always carry around pigs in my pocket, and everybody laughs at me and asks me what I'm doing. But it's, um, it is a very good technique. If you, even with clients, you can do it. Okay. Um, right, let's go back to this. All right. Um, the other thing that you can use um, for cats and for dogs actually is local and anesthetic spray if you're going to do um, any venous puncture. So this spray is actually a human drug. Um, it's lidocaine or lecithin and phenylephrine. And we're mainly using it for the local and it's the lidocaine effect. Um, it is used to spray and down the larynx when you're intubating. So we use this for cats before we intubate and to paralyze the, um, the larynx and um, get rid of the rumor spasm. I know some of you don't use um, the inhalational anesthetic techniques, but it's still maybe worth getting a bottle of this from the human pharmacy if you can, um, just to um, aid um, when you're puncturing the jugular or the cephalic of animals. Um, so basically, I'll just clip the animal and then spray a little bit onto the skin, and usually within about half half a minute or one minute, um, it goes quite numb and you're able to slide in the catheter um, or your needle a lot easier because they don't feel it as much. Again, it's cheap, it doesn't hurt, if it doesn't work, you can lost a lot of a little time. Uh, and the last thing for cats is get a pink in, which I'll talk about later. All right, dogs, I'm sure a lot of you are used to using a muzzle. Um, we use one in our clinic that looks a little bit like this. Um, for dogs that have a very broad face, so American Staffies or Boxers um, or Rottweilers, you can get these ones which have an extra strap that comes um, in the middle between the eyes and to the, to the headband, um, which just sort of stops it from falling off because they don't have much of a nose. Um, the main thing with the muzzle is to place it from behind, so you don't want to come and put the muzzle on from the front because they can often get quite scared, they can run away, or they can turn and bite you. So you want to come come uh, from behind and gently slide it around the ear and onto the muzzle if you can. Uh, and once the muzzle is on, I always tell the owner or whoever whoever's putting it on to hold the head strap at the back hold it either to the collar or hold it to a scruff of skin because um, often dogs won't like it and they'll shake their head and they'll try and pull it off and if you're not holding that strap it can just come off um, which is a bit disappointing um, some of you may be familiar with the rope muzzle or a bandage muzzle um, that can be um, sometimes easier than um, one of these bigger muzzles and also if you don't have one available you can easily take it. I'll see if I can show this to you on the next slide. So yeah, so basically it's just um, tying your rope or a bit of bandage in a little um, semi knot like this, sliding it over, over the nose, coming underneath and then tying it to the back there like that um, and that can be quite effective. Now the two things wrong with this photo is that the person is putting it on from the front, which you don't really want to do. Um, you always want to come from behind, and also the tighter and less the dog, you always want to hold the strap, collar, and strap before walking away, um, so that they won't um, get it off. Now another technique that 
that I learned a couple of years ago from one of my nurses is the smaller dogs, um, you can use it in bigger dogs, but it's easy in smaller dogs because um, they're smaller in comparison to the towel, is to roll the towel up like this and tie it just around their neck, a little bit like a scarf. And the advantage of doing this is that is they find it difficult to be able to turn around and then bite. Um, your hand. So you can see this, um, this dog here, he's got a bit of a, bit of a neck brace and he, he can't really turn and, and, and bite his hand here. If he wanted, he could probably turn and bite this one if he wanted to, um, so that hand should be moved. But it is quite good. Often you can combine the technique, so you can put a towel around the neck to stop them from wriggling so much to steady the head, and then you can place the muzzle on uh, once you've got the strength of the head. So I've got a video if I can. Um, show that to you now. It's going to work. So this is um, just demonstrating putting on a rope muzzle. This is one of my nurses' jobs. Can you see that? Can you see that one? Can you guys see this video? Yes. It's yeah, cool. All right. So this dog's not aggressive uh, at all. Um, please repeat the video. You want me to repeat it? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so coming from behind um, and just dropping it quickly over the over the muzzle, tying it underneath, and then tying it the back there. You can see it's not super, super secure. The dog can still move the mouth because um, it's obviously eating a treat. So often I'll put another muzzle on top of that once I put that one on if I'm not um, confident. Okay, and then this is one where I'm wrapping the towel around the neck first to steady the head, and then someone else is putting the rope muzzle on. Okay, so came from behind and securing the towel so she can't turn, and then someone else is coming and putting the muzzle on and tying it to the back. And you can see there that her neck is nice and secure, and it'll be harder for her to turn around the bike. Um, just go back a little bit. Um, the other thing that you may or may not be familiar with, we call it a head tap. And basically all it is is just tapping the head of the cat or the dog, um, often just to distract them so that they are um, concerned about what's happening at the head and not about what's happening in their legs or their tails or something else. The head tap has to be really firm. So not, not really catting and not just doing this. You want them to almost be <laughs> very firm on the head. You're not going to... Um, do any brain damage uh, to be firm, not aggressive. Um, sometimes I'll use a pen um, if I don't want to get my fingers too close to the head of, or the mouth of the cat. Um, but just serving as a bit of distraction can also help with the And then for dogs, we can use trazodone or Okay, so that's all right. So um, talking about drugs, pre visit pharmaceutical, I guess is their technical name, or PVP. Um, they're not pre-medications, they're actually what the owner will give um, about 90 minutes, so one to two hours before the vet visit, so before they get to your clinic. Um, and sometimes they can also give it the night before as well if they want um, to eat for a vet. Um, and so when they come into the clinic, they're already a little bit sedated. The dose rates um, of these drugs is usually quite variable, so it can be difficult to judge the exact dose rate for each individual. Um, so we usually advise the client to do a trial dose at home um, first before they come in. So on another day, give the medication, see how sleepy they get. If they need to increase it um, on the day of the vet visit, they can do that. So usually if I'm dispensing the medications, I'll write something like this on the label. So it's quantity, 150 milligrams, five tablets. Um, sedative, give two tablets 90 minutes prior to vet visit. Trial dose at home. And then dose may be increased to two and a half tablets if needed on the day. And usually um, when they come in with the, with the medications on board, I'll say, how much did you give? And they might say, oh, well, we tried two tablets yesterday and he didn't really get very sleepy. So today we've tried two and a half. And then I'll say, um, okay, with two and a half tablets, a good dose. If not, um, maybe next time we should try three, three tablets. So it's just a bit of a dusting fine tuning that we need to do. Generally, they last between four and eight hours, so it's a nice amount of time uh, for them to, to, to have the procedure and then go home. 
Um, and I'll use this a lot, I guess, for um, anxious animals, aggressive animals, fearful animals. They can be used for routine vet visits, so ones that are just scared to come in, even for their vaccinations or health checks, um, sometimes I can give them. Um, ear medications. Last week we talked about managing difficult or recurrent ear infections. A lot of the time if they're really painful, then owners actually can't get the medication deep into the ear canal. So in these cases, the animal will be brought back to the clinic um, once a day and um, the staff, yourself or one of your nurses or assistants will put the medications out. If these animals are a bit aggressive in the clinic, they can have these um, pre-visit pharmaceuticals and when they come in, they should be nice and calm for you to be able to administer the medication. Um, bandage changes, I've got um, one dog coming in every three to four days at the moment in one of my clinics for a bandage change. He broke his toe um, and he needs to have a bandage change all the time. It's obviously a bit painful. He's a very nervous dog um, and he gets he actually gets two tablets of the quantity um, just before he comes in and we're able to hold him, change the bandage and send him home and we don't need to get any injectable um, sedative on top of that. Which is really good. Um, nail trims, a lot of cats um, get very stressed with nail trims or little dogs like pugs uh, or even big dogs and just to make things um, less stressful I will often give these just so that you can trim the nails. And, them. and then sometimes I'll give them to owners to give at home for uh, when there's a storm, um, if there's fireworks um, or any other say big house parties that the dog always gets scared of. So around Christmas time every year I usually get a few clients coming in saying well, you know, it's going to be New Year's next week and there's going to be a lot of fireworks and my dog's going to be very scared. Can I please have some services? And then I'll give them one of these to get at home so they can not be scared when the New Year comes in. And lastly, travel. Um, so I have a, a lovely old man and his lovely old cat. It's a nice cat, but it gets so scared traveling to and from the clinic in the cat box. Um, and every time it has diarrhea, so it defecates all over the carrier all in the towels, all down its tail and its back leg. I get to the clinic and I check it over uh, and then the nurses have to clean the cage, clean the towels, clean the bum and dry it off, send it home and on the way home it then will have diarrhea from fear and stress and then the owner will have to do the same thing at home. So the last time it came in I actually got the owner to pick up some gabapentin beforehand. He gave that to the cat and the cat was so relaxed in the car that it didn't poo at all and it just makes our lives, everybody's lives, a lot easier. So it can be used in situations like that as well. Okay, so what are these drugs? Um, the first one I'll talk about is gabapentin. Can anybody tell me uh, what gabapentin is usually used for? What do you use gabapentin for usually in your practice? I think maybe some of you will, will be familiar with this drug. Oh. Oh. For uh, reducing the nerve pain or nerve damage, pain, nerve compression pain. That's right. So it's a good um, analgesic, and like you said, yeah, it can be good for neurological pain. Very good. Um, there's another effect that gabapentin has. Does anybody know? Can you chat box? Seizures, exactly. So it's actually an anti convulsant as well. It's probably not your first line anti convulsant treatment um, for newly diagnosed seizures, but it can be used as an adjunct to other drugs like penobarbital. So it's a good anti seizure medication. Um, and the third effect, I guess, um, and here what we're using it for is sedation. So you may have noticed when you use um, gabapentin for one of the other two reasons, they may seem a little bit sleepy to start off with. Often the body will get used to it after a while, um, or you can reduce the dose, but another side effect is sedation, and that is what we want to be using it for. Um, so the dose rate um, for cats is about 100 milligram capsule per cat. Um, often owners can't pill the cats very well. Um, so I, in that case, I say you can open up the capsule and sprinkle the contents onto some food if it will eat it. Um, or you can um, mix the contents into a syringe, mix it in with some water. And as the cat is hissing at you, you can just squirt the water into the mouth. Um, they don't actually need a whole 100 milligrams. Sometimes if they get 50 or 75, they can get, a, you can get away with it and they can still be sedated. So that's always good to, um, to use. Dogs can, it can be used as well, 10 to 30 milligrams per kilo 
um, yeah, um, it tends to use it more for cats, um, but dogs is fine to use as well. Right, hazardose. This is another human drug. All of these are human drugs, actually, so you should be able to get them from your human pharmacy, which is good. Hazardose is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, and as you may remember, serotonin is your happy hormone. So trazodone makes, um, allows you to be more happy hormone traveling around the blood system and leads to a, a, a sort of more calmer animal. Um, with dogs, you, you can start between four and seven legs per kick. Um, I used to start them at two to three and then found that it didn't have much of an effect. So now I start them at least probably four legs per kick. Um, and then you can go up to 14 or even higher, I guess it's, it's, it is quite safe to give, but usually I don't need to go that high. Cat, 25 milligrams per cat. I haven't used it much in cats. Um, I think it can work, but there's probably less, less data on it. I mean, there's not heaps of data for dogs either, um, but enough to be able to say it's safe to use and effective. And then you've got clonidine. So clonidine is an alpha-2 agonist. Can anybody tell me um, what other alpha-2 agonists are commonly used in everyday practice. What, what other alpha 2 do you use? Xylazine. Xylazine, very good. I know you use a lot of xylazine. Um, any others? Does anyone use um, metatomazine? Indomitor? Another alpha 2 agonist that we use. Okay, so it's in the same family. Uh, for dogs, I tend to use it for dogs starting at 10 micrograms per kit. You can go up to this. It stays in the literature, but I'm going to have to. What was that? Sorry? Metazolum. Metazolum. I think that might be metatomidine. Quite similar to metatomidine. Yeah. Um, so it's in the same family. So it's the same effect, but clonidine will often not cause, at these dose rates, not cause such profound sedation. Um, there's less data for its use in cats. Um, but this is this is what the literature says. I haven't used it yet before actually. Um gabapentin or trisodon is a good thing Um so with these PVPs, they can also be used for post-op confinement. So they can be used multi um, every four to six hours or six to eight hours as needed. And they can be given for um, the long term if you need to. So some of our orthopedic patients that need to be cage rested for four weeks or six weeks. Sometimes we'll go home with boxes and boxes of them just so they can remain calm inside their cage while they're resting after surgery. Even with your spays and neuters, you can also send them home with um, a few tablets if the owner is worried that the animal can be dumping up and down for three days after the spay. Um, they can just be calm with the ones as well. If you use it long term, potentially you want to wean them off it slowly just in case they develop a bit of dependence. Um, and they are generally really safe. Um, gabapentin, you know, there's not too many terrible side effects to think about. Um, I guess if there's existing liver or renal issues, you just want to think about the excretion, like all drugs might be delayed. Um, existing cardiac issues if they've got hypertension. Um, or if you're going to use xylazine um, later in the day, um, just to be careful because clonidine can cause a little bit of a little bit of hypertension, probably not heat and heat. Um, so if you're going to put the animal under anesthetic later on and use xylazine as part of that, you might want to use gabapentin or trazodone instead of clonidine. And there's the syndrome called serotonin syndrome, which I won't talk too much about. It's when um, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor like trazodone is combined with some of these drugs um, and can cause some sort of um, cumulative effects, the behaviour specialist that um, recommended all these drugs to us didn't think that it was very significant. So you can look it up later if you want just to be aware, but um, I don't think it's a huge problem. Um, and and with anything, if, if you're concerned or you're not sure about using these drugs, just start at a lower dose um, and see what happens. Monitor them really closely, and you can always increase the dose later on. Okay, and two more tips to finish. Um, this is one of my favourite things to talk about, I guess, because it is just so effective. Um, the gentle leader um, head collar or the whole thing. So this is. Um, used instead of a, a collar or a harness and it goes over the nose here and then just behind the head. And when uh, the owner pulls on the lead, it puts a bit of pressure on the nose here. So you've got a lot more control of the head and it's really useful for dogs that pull uh, or very strong or they lunge quite a bit or they go and, you know, want to talk to every dog or every 
new person and they're just pulling the owner along by the arm. Um, I usually describe the way that this works um, by using the horse um, as an example. So um, can somebody tell me if you want to lead a horse around or have control of a horse, what do you do to it? What, what piece of equipment do you put on the horse to lead the horse around? Some of you maybe deal with horses before, or even if you don't, you might have seen it on TV. What do you put on a horse to um, control it? Um, I'm not sure if this is right, but a halter? That's right, exactly. A halter, okay. a halter or bridle, exactly. So you put something on its head and you can lead yeah. a 500, 700 kilo horse around and control it. If you want the horse to pull a cart, um, what do you use? What do you put on the horse? You want it to pull a cart. Does anybody know? Can they think? <coughs> anybody seen on TV the, the horse racing? Oh, we've got a. Yeah, we put a harness. That's right. I mean, you put these on dogs as well, the huskies or the sled dogs, if you want them to pull a sled, you put a harness on them and they can put their whole body weight and they can pull you along. So it's the same thing with um, walking the dog. If we put something around its neck, like a collar, and then put something around its shoulders, like a harness, basically they can get all their strength from their shoulders and pull you along. Um, and they can cause damage to, I guess, you know, the owner as well. Um, but if you put something on their head, you've got so much more control and they can't pull you with their head. Um, so I recommend these a lot. The only thing to note is that you can't just put it on the dog and expect to go for a walk because they usually don't like that. They're not used to having something on their head. So if they're not used to that, they can just rip it off and eat it and it's gone. So you often need to show them the halty or the gentle leader and give them a treat. And show it to them, give them a treat. Then after that, you need to like gently rub it against their face and give them some food. And then you can drape it over their neck give them some food, slowly put it on for five seconds, give them some food, and eventually you can take them for a walk in it um, and they'll be used to that. And that leads us on to the second um, and final tip, just desensitization, um, where with anything, so putting a halter on or animals that don't like their nails being touched or trimmed or you know have their ears being handled, you can desensitize them. You can do it when they're puppies as well, it works really well. Uh, when they're puppies and haven't learned bad behaviours. So I just recommend touching the ear very gently and then giving them a treat. Doing that maybe every day for a week. And after that, you can start to put the finger down the ear, um, get the puppy used to that or the dog used to that, and then give them a treat. So they just get used to that. Um, I'm just going to show you my cat. Finally, just now, because he's right here. This is my cat. His name's Kerchik, and he hates, he hated his paws being touched. I got him as a rescue. And he also hated his, his mouth being looked at. He had a lot of teeth removed when he was at rescue. But what I, and it was such a pain to trim his nails um, all the time. And he has, has such big long nails. So what I do now is that every meal, time before meal, he, he loves his food. And I get him to give me his paw. And then we just check one nail at a time. And we have a look at them. And we decide which one we want to cut. And then we just trim one nail at a time and then after we get to trim one nail he can have his food so he doesn't love having his nails trimmed but he doesn't freak out and scratch me and bite me all the time because he knows that once he gets it done he can have his food so in that way i've desensitized him um and he's he's 15 so if he can learn um things when he's 15 years old then with a little bit of perseverance i think your client and patient um can do something similar as well so with that I think that is all um, I have to share. Hopefully you haven't gone too long and I will try and attempt to um, answer any questions that you may have. Over to you, Dr. Sixer. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Esther, for a very detailed presentation. This is a time for all of us to ask questions. This is the time of question and answer. Either you can unmute yourself and you can ask question directly to Dr. Esther, or you can put it in the chat box. 
so she can read and she can respond to your question after that we'll have a group photograph then closing prayer so it will be over within short time so please stay with us don't leave and if you have any question please put it in the chat box there was a question earlier about um, the sutures from Dr. Rocco, I think. Um, I didn't quite understand the question. Did you want to ask that again? It was okay. about... Where is the question? I didn't see that. Oh, it just was in the chat box to me about um, putting the sutures in the ear for the oral hematoma. Do they want to ask that question again? Yeah, who, who put the question? Can you can you put it uh, again? Rocco? Is it Rocco? I could not see that. No, it, it was it was just for me. I might just see. They might have gone. That's okay. Others can ask questions. <coughs> can I have a question, please? Sure. Uh, I just wanted. Uh, I just want to ask. Uh, in your experience, you know, or in your practice, how do you do? How do you decide uh, the time for the surgery in order hematoma? Do you mean do you do it straight away, or do you tell them? To oh come yeah, back? yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So how generally, do how that's do you right. decide? So it's generally not an emergency. Um, so it doesn't need to be done on the same day if you can't. Usually, I'll just tell them to go away and come back the next, maybe in the next one to two days. I guess if you leave it for too long, and it depends how long it's been there, um, the body will start to try and heal it, and then it will become a little bit more difficult um, to flush everything out. So if it's really fresh, and most of the time the owners will notice it straight away, like they won't notice it, for, well, it probably is not there for five days and then they notice it, unless they're quite um, negligent. Um, so if it's just come up in the last day, it can wait maybe one or even two days. Um, and I'll just usually just put them in that week to do the surgery. Um, and then, but I'll also start treating the ear infection if I can um, on that same day, um, if that's possible. Okay, thank you. Any, anyone wants to ask anything, you can ask directly. I'll put it in the chat box. There's a question here about the bandaging of the oral hematoma. Uh, okay. Bandaging. It isn't necessary. I just, well, I guess I feel that it's not because I've never done it <laughs> on all my hematoma cases and they've, you know, they've been okay. Um, like I said, some of them come back, but I don't think it's because I don't put a bandage on. I was never taught to bandage at university and I've never seen it being done. But in some of the textbooks, they will talk to you about bandaging. So, <coughs> In my opinion, it's not necessary, but um, and I think Debbie said that uh, Dr. Debbie said that she doesn't bandage either. So, um, yeah, there might be other vets that come across that say it is, and they they heal better. Um, but I don't have a lot of experience with bandaging, and I would say that probably to start off with, um, if you just manage to do the surgery, it's probably probably okay to start with. That. Bandages do not work. Okay, there's there's a more confident there's a confident um, answer from Dr. Helen. Bandages do not work. There you go. There's the answer. <laughs> so just but, in India, but in our practice, we have uh, we have uh, we have a lot of cases uh, we did the bandaging, and I don't see there was any problem with that, except in few cases when the temperature is so humid, then it gives us a problem. Otherwise, I don't see any problem putting the bandage. Right. Um, are you doing the bandages as well as the surgery, or are you just drain? Are you after just, the surgery, right but, after the surgery. So you're putting the you're putting those sutures in. You're putting those stents in. The sutures. We, we, uh, after the sutures, yeah. We, we we normally keep a pressure bandage. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, look, you might want to. I mean, if they're working for you and you think they're good and the animal's tolerant of them, I don't think you need to to change that. Um, but maybe one or two, you might just experiment and try leaving the bandage off and seeing if that um, yeah, yeah. makes any difference. Next can, time, I think I should try without a bandage. Yeah, you can do your you can do your own clinical study, and then yes, you can yes, yes. then you can write up a paper for us 
Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Assessing the uh, necessity of standards be interesting. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, can you stop your screen? Then we all can yeah, take a yeah, sure, yes, photograph. Yes, there we are. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if there's no more question, you can switch on your, your video. We'll take a group photograph. Maybe Debbie can help us to take the picture. I just had one, one question. Um, you, you, yeah. Have you um, ever come across or used uh, pheromones for cats to get them to be calm? Yes, that's right. So, um, yes, I do. There's one called Belly Way um, that's on the market. I don't. Do you guys have Belly Way there? Belly Way is um, a pheromone or daptyl, dog appeasing pheromone, DAP, no, in India. Um, pheromones are, I guess, um, I don't know how I describe them to, to clients. I guess a scent that only the, the animal can, can smell. Um, but they, they breathe it in um, and it acts on the brain and, and calms them down. So, yes, um, Dr. Smith, I do, and I use Sally Way a lot, or I recommend it a lot. Um, so, that's definitely something to consider, but I didn't know if it was available in any way. Um, and also, it can take a while to kick in, so over a few weeks to, um, to a month. So, it's not usually as acute as giving them gabapentin and then you can trim the nails um, two hours later. Thank you. Okay, homeopathic rescue remedy um, helps as well, um, to Dr. Debbie. Yeah, I've used a bit of rescue remedy um, with my horse. Um, and again, it is, it is safe to use, um, and a lot of people, yeah, think that it works. And so it's, uh, if it's available, it's worth a go from there.